And so uh, just based on what we've read, just some thoughts before we enjoy a time of fellowship with one another, um, just rabbinical teaching. So uh, interesting concept, like we've already talked about and read about, the idea of wrestling with God. And uh, what a strange concept, as much as uh, we might have heard about this exchange growing up, it is maybe peculiar to think about the God that created all that exists, that all the world, all the mountains, that put all the planets in space as we understand it, who controls the tide, right, who made this beautiful body that we enjoy that heals itself and just exists on a, on a microbiological level, everything that is and all the power that sustains all of that. And yet God would see fit to, to wrestle with us without just vanishing us in an instant, it's very interesting to contemplate what it really means that that would happen, that that would, uh, that that would take place. So I just had a, a picture for us to look at uh, for just a moment, right? This is, not, this is about to be a not good day for that gentleman right there, right, with the red gloves. And uh, just a couple of things that I desire to, uh, to, to, to point out. Uh, with regard to this, uh, this little photo here that, that kind of tie into a brief message for the evening. Uh, number one, and everything I'm about to say, just a disclaimer, I'm saying as a layman, I've never been in that octagon, nor do I plan on it. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, that being said, um, this is, to my understanding, this uh, gentleman right here who is throwing his fist is executing what we uh, know to be a Superman punch, which is very unique in that it is not just the strength of his arm, his shoulder, his biceps, forearm that is uh, going into this punch here. But the unique element of such uh, an attack, we might say, is that the fighter jumps forward. And so they throw their entire body weight into this one punch and they are leaping through the air essentially channeling momentum and weight both with them all behind a singular fist that is meant to devastate the opponent as it looks like it's right about to here right however at the same time you might observe that a lot of his inner area that most of the time you'd want to keep very very guarded is totally open so it takes a great deal of uh, commitment if someone is going to uh, going to make an attack like this, you'd want to make sure that you're going to land it, because <laughs> uh, counters are a very real thing in combat sports, in combat in general, but combat sports. And um, so, this idea of commitment for me is a big takeaway. That someone would utilize a move like this, you'd want to calculate it to make sure it's worth the effort and it's worth the risk. So, if we are going to step into a ring with God Himself. Um, the recommendation would be the same. Is it really worth it? Re wrestling God over whatever it is that I'm preparing to battle him over. But number two, again, the photo in particular, just uh, this idea of MMA. Does anyone know offhand what MMA stands for? Hey, there's a lot of people that knew that. Mixed martial arts. Mixed martial arts. Again, layman, right? The idea is that the person that steps into the ring with you can use any kind of martial arts within the rules at their disposal. There is no expectation that they are going to use a particular style. And so unless you've studied the fighter that you're up against, it is potentially not going to be a good day. It's not going to go very well because uh, they can use their arms, they can use their legs, they can take it to the floor, they can just knock you straight out, right? There's a lot of different things that they can do. And so the idea is just to be thoroughly prepared, thoroughly studied. And so these people invest time studying all different kinds of styles and harnessing all different kinds of moves and defenses and offenses. Very interesting. But the idea, again, preparation and versatility of skill that is cultivated to be prepared for something like this. And so just twofold, making sure that it's worth it and committing, committing to the risk that it takes, but also being uh, thoroughly prepared to, to go the full uh, distance with the opponent, as it were, uh, God himself in this case. And we'll explain that. Of course, God is not our enemy. 
God is willing and eager to wrestle with us. Just a mean idea. However, he desires uh, family more than followers. More than followers. So I would submit to you that this second line here is arguably the reason why God is willing to wrestle us in the first place. That he is, he is eager to, uh, to, to go through this process, this push and pull, to receive our, uh, our questions, our, our abstract punches, you might say. Because he doesn't want us just following him because we have to, because he'll crush us if we don't. And uh, just hatred burning and fueling in our heart. But we're there with him nonetheless, right? That's not the ideal for God. Desiring a family, desiring people that love him, that want to be there with him, that are there because they want to be a family, a family, not just a, not just a bunch of, of people, of subjects that are submitted. And of course, there is an element of that. But love, this uniqueness, uniqueness, that the God, at least that we serve, wonderfully enough, is willing to be questioned, is willing to be wrestled, and he does not shy away from it. And at the same time, I would say maybe he takes it easy on us <laughs> and walks us through it pretty well. But calling to the mat, calling to the mat, first little point. So just to set up, just to kind of summarize, as we read, Jacob's preparing to meet his brother Esau for the first time in quite a while. Uh, if you remember, he worked seven years for, for Leah, then another seven for Rachel. So it's at least been 14 years since he's seen his brother. It's their first time meeting, though, since the birthright was stolen by deception, like we talked about last week. It was not on good terms that they uh, departed, basically. Jacob stole from Esau and then bolted out of there so that Esau did not take his life. So Jacob, as we find him, appears terrified and uncertain of the outcome. So he seeks to appease Esau with gifts, a lot of gifts, just like, please forgive me. Don't kill me. I apologize. Uh, Please, please, please. Amen. And so that just kind of gets into the passage that we read where Jacob, he wrestles with this, uh, with this angel. It's the way that the, the portion summary described it. But just drawing attention to one of the verses here. So Jacob remains all by himself. Then a man, it's the way that it's described at least in the, the Tree of Life version, wrestled with him until the break of dawn all night. All night. So Jacob engaged another. Just a little bit of, of uh, just kind of word study. Just have a little fun with it together. Jacob engaged uh, another. Ish is the word that's used. So it's more of a contrasted word to Adam. Think of Adam. Formed from the dust of the ground is, is one word that is used to describe man or to describe humanity. Another word is ish. It can be translated man. Most commonly is translated Man, but interestingly enough, we find different places in the scripture where it simply refers to another. A bit of a mystery. Another being. Another being. In a, in a wrestling or a, uh, or a dust up. And I uh, felt like these things were interesting and just desired to share them with you. Um, this word wrestling is, uh, at least from what I found, welcome to correction. It's never used anywhere in the Old Testament except for in this passage. When Jacob wrestles and uh, maybe one or two other places that are talking about this story. And uh, the root word where, where, we, where we translate wrestling comes from dust. So as if to imply that they were in the dust together during this, during this period. Perhaps reminiscent of, of Adam being created from the dust. As God is forming a new nation out of these, out of these people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they do this all night, and it's awesome, for one, that Jacob could even wrestle all night, right? Because going 12 rounds, whatever it is, like that's challenging enough. But to imagine 12 hours of just wrestling a divine being, I would imagine he was quite strong. But he made it through nonetheless. And so this entire setting suggests a, a time of uncertainty, yet of strong uh, determination for victory. So it's dark, it's at night, Jacob is all by himself. He's with a being that he's, that he's wrestling. 
There's no guarantee that he's going to win. No guarantee that he's going to survive, that he's going to make it. But Jacob is determined to make it all the way and is able to wrestle him all night long. And he ends up prevailing, as we read about. But just the next verse drawing our attention to, then he said, this, uh, this being, this person, he says, let me go for the dawn has broken. It's a new day now. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So it suggests that the fight was Jacob's to win. And secondly, this impacted me a lot. <laughs> Jacob seeks something that cannot be won by mere wrestling and dominance. And I really felt it on my heart, if nothing else, to share that. That Jacob had wrestled this this man, as it translates it, all night long. And he is still so close to losing, even though he prevails, even though he wins. Because what he wants cannot be won in the flesh, cannot be won by his strength, cannot be won by his smarts. It has to be given to him. There's nothing that he can do to force this figure, this person, to bless him. And so now, even though he defeated him, now he's holding him and saying, I'm not going to let you go. You have to bless me. Right? You have to bless me. And so even though he won, he's so close to losing, as it seems. And so it's an impactful thing that, uh, that maybe we'll, uh, we'll come back to. This figure asks him, what is your name? Who are you? And he says, uh, Jacob. Jacob is my name. And then he says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but rather Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and you have overcome. Other ways to understand it. You've endured. You've shown yourself able, that you have the capacity, the ability. And so the word uh, Israel, the word Israel itself, this idea of Fighting with God is in this name, Israel. Fighting with God, struggling with God, wrestling with God is the name that is given to him. But uh, the timeline for me felt really interesting. We find Jacob acknowledging his deceit and a desire to be something more. And why do we say that? Because the names in Hebrew... To us, we have to translate it, but to them, they don't. And so, maybe you've heard this before, but the figure looks at Jacob. And he says, you want the blessing, right? You want the blessing, tell me who you are. Tell me who you are. And he says, I am a deceiver. That is who I am. And the, everything that I've gotten in this birthright, this is how I've gotten it. And this is where my ability has gotten me to get blessing for myself, essentially, has all culminated in this moment right here. And it looks like this is the furthest that my ability will take me. Right? And so, are you, are you willing, Jacob, to acknowledge where you are, perhaps to leave that behind if you really want to become something different and you want to become something more and to be blessed. And for me, it was super powerful. As far back as Genesis, this idea of repentance and turning from his own ability, from his own, from his own, I can do it. And I'm smart, and I'm cunning, and I can trick people, and I can work hard for 14 years, right? And it'll get me so far. But the blessing of God, <laughs> not that far. Not that far. It has, to be, it has to be beyond us. It has to be from God. It has to be given. It has to be received. So making strides, just to kind of go through what we've read. So Jacob goes from this place with this blessing that he receives. And eventually he meets his brother, as we read, right? And he finds Esau, a man who weeps to finally see him again. 
And what a, what a relief I would imagine that was, right? That he was thinking he was about to get killed. And his brother's so happy to see him again that he's crying and weeping on his shoulder. It's a beautiful reunion I would imagine that was for both of them, really. It's like, man, I'm so glad. But Jacob departed with nothing. He ran. He was fleeing for his life. But he returned a man full of blessing. But after this wrestling experience, after this, maybe we, we could say, a transformational experience on the inside of him, when he finally meets Esau again, we, as we read, this idea that everything that you see, everything that I'm offering you, right, God, God has dealt graciously with me, right? Not it was that birthright that I stole from you, right? Not it was the 14 years of work that I did by my power that earned me this. But we see even this soon after the experience that Jacob says, God is the one who gets the credit for everything that you see right here. When I left with nothing and I've returned a blessed man, that is why, that is why. So finding true victory, true victory. Just for the sake of uh, just kind of going through the Parsha, I invite you to read it all. Uh, just uh, some narrative here. Jacob's daughter is uh, defiled, raped, just how we understand it, by one of the Hivite sons. While living in a, a foreign land, Jacob goes to the land of the Hivites. He buys some land. They're living there. Everything's good. But then this happens with his daughter. So his sons, Jacob's sons, are adults at this point. They put together a plan to basically slaughter the inhabitants, as inhabitants, it was, uh, the males in particular, of that city. It was uh, pretty intense, basically. What they did was uh, they put together this kind of agreement of like, hey, you did this to our sister. And then he comes wanting to marry her. So they're saying, you know, we'll give her to you in marriage. But we circumcise ourselves as males, so we require that you circumcise yourselves, and then we will give her to you if you're willing to do that. So they do it, and then while they are healing and in pain, probably a lot, uh, the sons of Jacob just kind of go in there and just take them all out while they're recovering. Not very nice. But that's what they did because they were uh, understandably probably furious <laughs> with this that happened. And so scripture does not, as, as it really does in, in a lot of Old Testament places, doesn't really comment morally on whether this was the best thing to do. Jacob for sure isn't super thrilled over it because basically we're in this land and now you've done this thing. What are they all going to think about me as a people? And pretty much says, like, there is a lot of people here that if they hated us, we would not last very long, right? But interestingly enough, the Lord, very soon after this, leads Jacob, protects Jacob, protects his family, even in the midst of this conflict. But he leads Jacob and his family to put away all of these foreign gods that somehow ended up in their midst, right? So did that contribute to this conflict as far as maybe flirting more spiritually with this foreign land possibly but nonetheless the lord is saying i'm your god i'm the one that you serve i don't need supplements i don't i don't need backup right i'm gonna be here i'm gonna be here i'm never out sick never out sick i don't take a vacation i own the whole thing i own the whole thing i'm everywhere all at once but just this last this last passage just to read a little bit further into it. Genesis 35, verse 9. God appeared to Jacob again, second time, after he returned from Padan Aram, and he blessed him. He blessed him. God said to him, your name was Jacob, was the deceiver, but you're, no longer will your name be Jacob, for your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. The scripture tells us again. God names him Israel. God also said to him, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God who is able. It's a fun, it's a fun uh, uh, study, this, this El Shaddai that's used in relationship to Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob, I believe, to Moses, when Moses is being called to deliver the children of Israel, this idea of, of a covenantal almighty God, and we translate it almighty. It's a, a bit mysterious in its use, though, but it is used in these very powerful, foundational, covenantal, I am capable of fulfilling what I am talking about. And he says to Jacob, be fruitful and multiply, if that sounds familiar. A nation and an assembly of nations will come from you. From your loins will come forth kings. From your loins will come forth kings. It's a beautiful thing. The land that I gave to Abraham and to Isaac, his father and his grandfather, I give it to you. And to your seed after you, I will give the land. Amen. So just a few things. Jacob is renamed maybe a second time, right? That's how it looks. It's very interesting that both of these passages are in the same Parsha. Just a couple of ways to maybe look at it. We maybe see that this was a prophecy being fulfilled as far as the verbiage that's used. Your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel when Jacob wrestles with the Lord. And then it's fulfilled by God. Another way of looking at it is he receives the name and then God is telling him more about what it means that he has a new name. Be fruitful and multiply, right? I'm including you in this land, in this covenant, in this, in this promise. Jacob is officially brought into this covenant as the third patriarch of Israel. So where we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And just kind of bringing it together. All together for us this evening from Numbers 23, verse 10. When we uh, sing the Matovu, when the children of Israel were supposed to be cursed, but they ended up being blessed. It's a peculiar expression that I just felt led to share from Numbers 23, 10. Who can count Jacob's dust? Who can number a fourth of Israel? Let my soul die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. Never been, uh, myself, I've never been compared to dust, right? It's kind of funny, maybe a little weird. But it's interesting to draw the uh, allusion, the reference to this wrestling that God uh, did with Jacob. This wrestling that Jacob did, this uh, being in the dust with God, and God multiplying him. And now, so many years later, God makes good on his promise. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And in Hosea chapter 12, we see Jacob talked about, Israel talked about, in the womb he grasped his brother's heel, and in his vigor he strove with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel, and he won. He wept and sought his favor. At Bethel, he will find us, and there he will speak with us. Again, underlining this point that I felt like was super impactful. Um, If we'd heard of a theophany, if we've ever heard of that before, this idea of the angel of the Lord, of Messiah, as it was being present in the Old Testament, interacting with with humanity. Just a bit of scriptural foundation for where where we might discern that straight out of the Bible, right? This... In Genesis, it describes it as each, a man, a figure. And then Hosea says he strove with God. But then he wrestled with an angel or one that came from heaven. One that came from heaven. So someone that came from heaven that was God and yet man somehow, right? How did that make any sense to them? But it sounds pretty familiar to us, wouldn't you say? But he wept. He wept and he saw his favor just to kind of bring it home for us this evening. For me, reading through Genesis, there was the idea that this might have happened. But it's really interesting that in Genesis, it doesn't say that Jacob wept. It just says, you know, I won't let you go till you bless me. Right? This idea that they're just kind of there. But just further underscoring almost Jacob begging for it. Begging for it. I want this blessing so greatly. I want this blessing so greatly, but there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do to take it from you, but I want it so much. I want so much to know that everything that I do in this life, that every step that I take, every decision that I make, that I'm not branded with this idea of being a deceiver, 
that it's only because of sin that I got where I am. Or it's only because of my ability or my cunning or my knowledge. Because that will only ever get me so far. I want to know that you approve of me. I want to know that you're with me. What can I do but, but, but wrestle it out of you, right? Compel you to bless me. But that was something that he could not do. He could not do. But he didn't have to do it, right? That's the beautiful thing and the application for us tonight. We come to God with a boldness and a confidence to wrestle for his promises. Ultimately, the only reason why we can ever come to God is because he allows us to. And maybe that sounds just a little too obvious. But God, he chooses to make himself known to us. He chooses to give us his scripture, his word, his Bible, his promises. And those are our foundation for coming to him. The covenant that he extends to us is our foundation for being in his presence in the first place. And so our battle is not for a thing, but for a person. As it was for, for Jacob. That it wasn't so much about the stuff. Or about the family. Or about the possessions. But it was about being with God. And being blessed by God. And one with God. And knowing that God was behind him. And was with him. And sometimes for me in the past. Maybe for all of us, it can feel a little challenging at times to be walking. And I want to, I want to be sure because this feels a little hard. This feels a little challenging. And I just want to make sure that I'm not doing it by myself, <laughs> that I'm not doing it alone. So beauty is found in realizing that God's blessing can never be taken. It can only be received. But it's a nice thing that he doesn't ask us for anything more than our heart in exchange for it. Maybe in like fashion to Jacob. That you acknowledge where you're at and you come with me. You just change what I tell you to change. And I'll help you do it. And everything will be fine. Everything will be fine through Messiah and his blood. Last passage, amen, Romans 7. So I find the principle that evil is pressing in me, the one who wants to do good. I want to do good, right? For I delight in the law of God with respect to the inner man, but I see a different law in my body parts, battling, right, wrestling, little theme, against the law of my mind and bringing me into bondage under the law of sin, which is in my body parts. This idea of this renewed, inner man that's been brought to life by Messiah, even after we take hold of God, that is wrestling the, 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 the death, the decaying fleshly nature that's separate from God, miserable man that I am, Paul says, who will rescue me from this body of death? But thanks be to God, it is through Messiah Yeshua our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God with my inner person, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Therefore, there, excuse me, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. For the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what was impossible for the law on account of our own weakness and inability, God has done it, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirements of the Torah, of the law, might be fulfilled in us. This eternal promise of life as we walk not according to the flesh but according to the Ruach, according to the Spirit. Just felt led to leave us with that idea this evening. That there is a very real uh, walk, a very real fight, a very real wrestle that we do initially to take hold of this God who is so beautiful. But then every day to be transformed into his likeness through the Spirit of God. The Ruach HaKodesh. And it's worth it every step of the way to reflect him more and more. Amen. Amen. I appreciate you walking with me through that, right? God is willing and eager to wrestle with those who follow him. May we all be found as his family 
more than just those that follow him. Of course we do, right? Of course we do, but we're not just followers. We're family. We are his own. We are his own. Amen. So we can, uh, we can be dealing punches with God, right, instead of just on the other end of them. Glory to God for that. Hey.